Live from the Cactus Creek at Ibri, he is the king of prime time, Ghana's undisputed entertainment laureate, and still the youngest old man in Ghana. Put your hands together, show some love for the indefatigable KSM. Okay, folks, look, today, today, today is a great day, and they are strong. You know, let me tell you one of the reasons I like this job. This is the only job that gives me the audacity to enter the office of the former president and invite him to his own office. Show me some love there. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and let us welcome to his own office former president John Dramani <laughs> Mahama. <laughs> <laughs> you remember? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to your office. It's not the first time I'm on your show, so. Uh, yeah, know you know, you know the yeah. deal. <laughs> That's right. No, thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay, folks, our president is in the house. No, we are in this house to take over the show and we'll be right back. The KSM Show. Cactus Creek. It is no longer Ghana's best kept secret. It's an open secret. So serene, so heavenly. And the meals? Mm, mm, mm. Just like home cooking. Cactus Creek. Your soul will thank you. You are always welcome. Home. Call our WhatsApp 055 039 5007. Azepa Essentials has good news for you. If you're in Takradi and its environs, don't worry. You can pick up Azepa Essentials jacket at Ruler Unisex Boutique in Anaji, Takradi, Queen of Peace in Takofo Road. Call or WhatsApp 0544-548766. Pulse Fitness Center, the premier destination for fitness in Ghana. Meet the indefatigable captain. There are three things that I love doing. Number one, workout. Number two, workout. Number three, workout. Workout put mind, soul, and body together. The captain has spoken. Bright lights, yeah, they make me dizzy, logo liggy. I just want the lizzy. Logo Liggy, uptown chasing for the Lizzie. Downtown, everybody busy. Logo Liggy, like me, Logo Liggy. I just want the Paul's Fitness Center, yeah. East Ligon Branch, Lizzie Sports Complex, I Cotton really Street, East Ligon, Accra, Ghana, 0302 519675. Kumasi Branches, Officers oh. Mess Branch, Denyame, Major Corbina Drive, Kumasi, 0541 871 602. Golden Tulip, Kumasi City Branch, Rain Tree Street, 0322 492 647. Pulse, the premier destination for fitness in Ghana. Say what lie we for around town. I know there are many of you who are interested in studying in either the USA or Canada. And for most of you, the test is the stumbling book. FX Hub is the only place that can train you to take and pass the test. It's the leading test training center in Africa. Call FX Hub on 0244-829-955. The KSM Show. We're back, we're back. I've been hunting you since 
2016. Yeah, been... I know. I've been very difficult to get. Yes, mm -hmm. but I have you here today. <laughs> finally. Uh, finally. <laughs> Before I start, let me start by congratulating you on your flag bearer ship. 98.1 percent. I think. Um, it was Something almost 99 percent. 99 percent. Yeah, it was 98. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, 98.7%. So. This is 98.7%. And in mathematics, you round off to okay, the nearest okay, okay. whole number. And the nearest whole number is 99. 99? Yes. Oh, my goodness. This was a comfortable lead. A very comfortable <laughs> lead. <laughs> Not like the 2016 Not like the 2016 one. <laughs> this was a real comfortable lead. Yeah. So, quickly, uh, those who run, I was going to say run against you, but it's not against you, it's the same party. So, those who run with you, quick comments, uh, Kojo Bonsu. Yeah. Um, Kojo Bonsu, you know, was the mayor for Kumasi. Kumasi, yeah. And then um, afterwards, um, he was the acting chair of the Goel board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. until we left office. Mm -hmm. And so he ran, and then uh, Dr. Dufo. Dr. Dufo, who yeah. had been former governor of the Bank of Ghana, and then finance afterwards, minister, minister of finance, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, he also ran. There was a third. A, a person, um, Kobia, I think. Yeah. Yeah, he came yeah. from the UK. Mm -hmm. But um, he later withdrew and threw his support behind me. So yeah. It was a three horse race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it went well. It went well. <laughs> so, um, will you consider appointing Kojo if you should be president? Eh? Oh, we've put the primaries behind us. Okay. And um, actually, I was discussing with um, the chairman of the party. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, to begin moves to bring, bring everybody together. together. Mm -hmm. We're asking for a reconciliation at all levels at mm -hmm. which elections were held. Mm -hmm. You know, we started from the branch to the constituency and then to regional and then to national. And so at any such reorganization or election, People win, people lose. Mm -hmm. But what you need to do is when you win, you, you must bring, bring everybody on board. Yeah. yeah. So I cannot ask them to reconcile at those levels, mm -hmm. and I don't reconcile at the presidential level. Mm -hmm. And so we'll stretch a hand out to oh. uh, Dr. Dufo and Kojo Bonsu. Okay. And then to my brother who withdrew and threw his support behind mm -hmm. me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think that's a problem. Great, great, great. I want to go back again, further back, staying further back, uh, 2016. Yeah. And I'm going to your concession speech. There's something you said in your concession speech that I always remember. Yeah. You said, posterity <clears throat> will be the judge of my time. Yeah. Now, my question is, were you saying that you, because you believe that so much mud had been thrown on you? Mm -hmm. You know, Muhammad became synonymous with the word incompetence. There was so much mud slang on you. Not because I believe. Everybody knows in Ghana that. Um, we, 2016 was a peculiar election. NDC had been in office for eight years, mm -hmm. but I had been president for only four years. Mm -hmm. And so as president, I was entitled to a second term. Mm -hmm. But if I got the second term, then it means NDC would have been in office for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And so MPP were determined to dislodge okay. us at that, at that election. Okay. So if and so anything yeah. was fair game for them. And they realized that the only thing standing between them and victory was my persona. Mm -hmm. And so just destroy Mahama as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And so they, they told all kinds of lies about me, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. about stealing money, corruption, hotels in Dubai. I mean, they all proved mm -hmm. not to be true. But at the time, it was difficult to dispel, you know, yeah. because they had a troll factory that was churning out all kinds of yeah. misinformation. Yeah. yeah, And that's why I said, Posterity will be the judge, judge of my time in mm -hmm. office mm -hmm. because we know that vindication li lies in the womb of time. And with time, the truth would always come out. Do you feel vindicated? Of course. Any human being will feel vindicated. I mean, the kind of lies that were told about me. I went out of office. I've been in this country. I was hoping that they would carry out some investigations into all the allegations they made about yeah. me. I actually challenged them. You know, after I left office, I said, all the things you said, DKM belonged to me. I had a hotel in Dubai, ships in Tokyo Harbor. Me and my wife had transferred World Bank money into Swiss bank accounts. I said, I'm here, I'm waiting. Mm. Just come mm. and investigate me. And nothing. Mm. So mm. I, I, I have the right to feel vindicated. Just that the situation in which we are 
you know, the situation into which they have plunged this country is not a time for gloating and saying, I told you so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just but do deep inside, what we have to do. You, you, you have the feeling of, I told you so? I mean, Ghanaians well, are saying, well, we sold our color TV and, and what the black and white. Yeah. Is, because, is that your feeling? Yeah, because NPP came in with a lot of propaganda and they were prepared to promise heaven in order to win political power. And so a lot of the promises that they made Ghana was like, just promise anything. I mean, I was watching a video of John Buedu saying, oh, is it about jobs? If it's about jobs, don't worry. There'll be so much jobs that Ghanaians can't do. We'll have to go and bring foreigners <laughs> to come and work uh, with, uh, to fill the rest of the vacancies. I mean, today, this is the highest level of unemployment in the history of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And so it was just say anything and win political power. But unfortunately, they have created a crisis of confidence in the population, in our democracy. Because now it's easy for Ghanaians to think that, look, politicians are liars. They'll just lie for political power. Yeah. And then some people say, look, every four years we have to go and vote. I don't see what I, I benefit from the voting because it doesn't make any change in my life. And that is what this eight years of MPP government mm -hmm. has created. Mm -hmm. We need to rebuild that confidence mm -hmm. in our democracy. Yeah. We Let need to convince Ghanaians that democratic governments are still the best way to unleash the creativity of our people okay. and be able to um, uh, create prosperity for our okay. people. Listening to you talking about the, the state that Ghana is in now reminds me of, of, of uh, 2020 election when you actually dubbed your campaign the rescue mission. Yes. You know, it was like Ghana is so bad, it needs to be rescued. So it's called the rescue mission. That was from the view and the NDC. And the MPP2 was saying four more for Nana. And Your Excellency, at the end of the day, Ghanaians decided four more. So do you think Ghanaians didn't feel that there was a need to be rescued or your communication was faulty? Our what happened? Our communication was spot on because we could see what was coming. Mm. We could see it. Immediately we finished the election, 2021, electricity tariffs that were free before the elections were put back. Yeah. And then government immediately introduced an NHIL levy. We have gone through a pandemic and we come out of the pandemic and you are charging us for the pandemic. And when we ask, what's the NHIL levy for? He says, oh, you think the free water and the free light you enjoyed <laughs> and the vaccinations we brought in and all that were free? So it was just a grand deception of the people. But we could tell, I mean, this government was headed for this crisis. One, because all the buffers we built, they used them and did not replenish. We had a sinking fund in which we left money, part of which they used to pay the COFO uh, euro bond. And then there was money left over. Any debts that were coming, they were paying. But we were committing a certain portion of the annual budget funding amount, that is the oil revenues, into the sinking fund for debt repayment. When they exhausted the sinking fund, they abandoned it and didn't put any money there again. Mm. So all the $3 billion they used to go and borrow, go and borrow $3 billion every year, they didn't spare a mind to put at least a bit in the sinking fund mm. so that they could use it to pay off some of the urgent debts that were accumulating. Then we also left money in the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, $270 million, I remember. They came and just used it. We left money in the stabilization fund. That's what built them out in the COVID period when there was no money anywhere and government didn't have a budget to handle COVID. We told them, look in the stabilization fund. That is what it was meant for emergencies like this. And so they went and took 200 and something million from dollars from the stabilization fund. Now today, all those buffers did not exist. They had misused them. And then they had pushed our uh, public debt from 120 billion to 577 billion. And so we had cautioned them. In 2019, I criticized the Minister of Finance. Our minority criticized him for the rate at which he was borrowing and said that, look, if you don't do something about it, we'll face a debt crisis in future. The records are all there. If you look at it, you, you'll find it. But apart from that, this Minister of Finance was doing something that I, I virtually, I, I would say, is criminal because he presents the budget statement. And then there are liabilities he knows are public liabilities. 
and yet he doesn't factor them into the budget. So the banking sector clean out. You say it cost you 22 billion. So it meant that government had to pay depositors 22 mm. billion. Whose liability is it? He says, no, there are receivers who are chasing people who owe the banks. And so we'll use that money to pay the depositors. But I mean, how much have the receivers been able to collect? I don't think they've collected even more than 1 billion uh, CDs. And yet government has guaranteed all deposits and so have put the deposits of those people's accounts into CBG and ha has paid them. And so it is a government liability. ESLA, we introduced ESLA. It started in October and then they took it over in January. The inflows that ESLA was supposed to receive to pay off legacy energy sector debt and petroleum sector debt they created an SPV, a special purpose vehicle, like a company. And then they made the company borrow money against the ESLA revenues. So now a lot of the ESLA revenues are collateralized, they're encumbered, mm -hmm. because they've taken that money and they've spent it. And so that also is a liability. Who owns ESLA SPV? Government of Ghana. Then energy sector debt, debt to IPPs. Today, I hear they owe them almost $1.8 but at that time, they owed them over one billion. So all these debts, including Get Fund, the collateralized Get Fund for about $1.5 billion, all these debts he puts as appendixes in the budget, but does not factor them into his accounting numbers. Mm. And so when he tells you he has a budget deficit of less than 5%, he's actually deceiving you. And he was doing that to create a better picture so that he could borrow more money off the market. Other the issues of conflict of interest, his own bank being the broker and all that. I mean, those are all ethical issues that mm -hmm. are clear to anybody. Yeah. To, How to does know. that make you feel then about this? Because sometimes I reverse things. And some of these things that you're talking about that uh, happened under the MPP, if it was the NDC in power, what kind of opposition do you think we would have expected from, from them? Was the opposition a bit too laid back? Because you are naming all these things and they happened in the glaring eyes of all Ghanaians and the recognized opposition. And for example, people were saying, you know, they were even accusing you. And I said, George should be up and shaking things. Actually, this uh, government has had an easy pass when it comes to issues of governance. Because if I did one tenth, of what they have done these last eight years. I'm sure that I would have been <laughs> pilloried and crucified on a cross <laughs> by now, you know. I mean, but it's also partly, it, there's a bit of hypocrisy in it, you know. There were a lot of people who were very vocal, not necessarily the opposition alone. There were clergymen, there were media people who wouldn't give us any breathing space, you know. And of course, the MPP as a party also added this. And then they had uh, organizations like Occupy Ghana, which are civil society organizations that were also breathing down our neck. Yeah. And so this trio symphony uh, orchestra of people mm -hmm. kept up such a cacophony about us, you know, a lot of it based on misinformation, but they, they did it to deadly effect. Mm -hmm. And so if it was us that did one tenth of this, you know, I'm sure that would have been pilloried. Um, right now, a lot of them give them an e easy pass because I do think that some of them are ashamed and uh, <laughs> some of them probably have an inclination or a soft spot for the MPP. And so when MPP is in government, anything can pass. But when it's another party in government, then suddenly they find their voices and start mm -hmm. uh, speaking. And so, so let's imagine for some reason uh, John Muhammad is returned to power and then he's in power and these same voices that you're saying were very loud under your regime now come back out loud again how would you react? Well um, I, I don't mind I'll welcome it because um, you welcome it? Yeah it makes us perform better all that criticism actually encouraged me to do better for instance, take the Doomso, all the noise about Doomso. You know, I went to Parliament and I said, yes, I take responsibility for it. I'm going to work day and night to fix this problem. 
and it occupied most of my time. And eventually, we fixed it. In 2016, January, we canceled the load shedding, so there was no more rationing of power. So the whole of 2016, nobody had any uh, load shedding based on any schedule, you know. And so criticism helps you be a better person if it's constructive. A lot of it was destructive, but it doesn't matter. It's still criticism. It makes you want to prove your critics wrong by doing even better. Why Nanado has performed so abysmally is that he got an easy pass and they develop a certain sense of impunity and they believe that whatever they do, nobody's going to talk. And so it makes them do the kind of things. It makes the society numb to all the scandals because every week there's a scandal. And so people get fed up of talking about it and say, look, there's nothing you're going to say that will change this. Nanado Baumia administration. So just leave it. It's one and a half years to election. Let's just bear it out and wait it out. But that's the beauty of democracy, that you get the opportunity to change governments at a point in time, you know. And I think that people are just waiting to take their time mm. and uh, go to the voting booths. People would have thought the same for the last election, that, hey, you know, there's no way on earth the way Ghana has gone to that anybody would consider giving four more to Nana. But people went to the booth and came out that there, the MPP won. That is because Ghanaians have a conception that four years is not enough to see where government is taking things. And so even though we're raising the red flag and saying that, look, they are mismanaging the economy, there's going to be a crisis ahead and all that, Ghanaians were willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. And that's how come they say, okay, let's give him another four years and let's see, he probably will do better. But their worst fears, our worst fears have been realized with what has just uh, happened. Because by 2020, they knew the economy was in crisis. Mm -hmm. The economy was in crisis before 2020. Mm -hmm. I'll get back to that, but let me ask this question here in terms of uh, Ghanaians have been saying, and you actually implied it when you said that um, there were, we have the mentality that each party is entitled to eight years, okay? So, in a way, it even affected you because even though it was your second term, it was the eight years, eight years of N NDC. Um, NDC yeah. So they wouldn't, uh, what would happen if MPP in fact breaks the eight? How would you react? Well, there'll be a breaking of the eight, but it will be a breaking of eight years of corruption, eight years of arrogance, eight years of impunity, that's what's going to break eight. So there'll be a breaking of the eight. Ghanaians are going to break that eight. <laughs> <laughs> You're very, very sure. Oh, that, there'll be a breaking the of the eight. Ghana yeah. But the breaking of the eight is going to be the breaking of the maladministration that Ghanaians have been through these last mm. eight years. Mm. It's going to break. There's going mm. to be a new dawn. What's your confidence level? Um, I'm highly confident. Um, since I um, ran for the primaries, it gave me the opportunity to go around the country and um, it has put me in the position to get to know the challenges that Ghanaians are handling. And speaking to farmers, to taxi drivers, to market women, to everybody, I mean, they are at the stage where a last straw would just break their backs. Mm -hmm. You did a similar tour though, uh, 20... Uh, 20. Yeah, 2020. Listening tour, I think that's what it was called. Yeah, and, and you went wrong. It was called a speak I, out. Yeah, speak out. We right. called it speak out. We, okay. That was to do with our manifesto. We wanted to incorporate the thinking of the people in our manifesto. And so we said, look, we're going to write our manifesto in a different way. We're not just going to get a few technocrats to sit and write our manifesto. We're going to go around and listen to the people. So we went to all the regions mm. and listened to all the people it, and Ghana varies in many ways. You go to some region and it's more about agriculture. You go to another region, the issues are about mining and galamse and things. You go to another place and it's about markets and commerce and things like that. If you go to Techiman, it's the biggest market in, in Ghana. It's about markets and trading and commerce and all that. You go to another place and the challenges are about roads. Western region and Western North, <laughs> roads are their main thing, you know. 
And so we said, look, let's go listen to everybody. We listened to Guta, we met with Abosokai, Spepard Zilas, we met with Ghana Bar Association, everybody. And then we crystallized all that into the mm. People's Manifesto. Mm. And that is the manifesto we ran on in uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. So that tour was called the Speak Out Speak Tour, out. Okay. but it was meant to input into our manifesto. But this, is, uh, this was to do with the primaries. And this was meeting mainly our party people. But in many places, the townspeople will not allow only the our party, party people, people to attend. They force their ways into the venue and say they are all involved in this matter. You can't call just your nine member executive and come and talk to them. We also want to be part of this, we want mm. to be heard. Mm. And so in many mm. places, the townspeople turn it into a rally. And um, you interact with them and you hear their concerns. Cocoa farmers are concerned about the cocoa industry, the poor produ producer price. And so if you notice, I called on government to increase the producer price mm. because our policy is that you must pay the farmer 70% of the international mm -hmm. market price. Mm -hmm. Right now, they are paying them far less, less than even 50% of the international market mm -hmm. price. You know. mm -hmm. So issues like that yeah. you know, have yeah. come up. I like the point you raised. I want to go back to it again. Entitlement. You know, that Ghanaians are saying that the parties now believe that each party is entitled to eight years. Okay, whether they perform well or not, they have not finished their eight years. With this mentality, do you, first of all, do you believe in it? Do you believe that Ghanaians have the mentality of entitlement? Well, it's not about entitlement. It is that when a president is elected, Ghanaians believe that a four-year period is not enough. So they are, they, are, they are willing to wait and see another four years mm -hmm. and see what the person can do. Mm -hmm. The peculiarity is just that Professor Mills died, mm. and then I took over as president. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise, Professor Mills would have done that second term. Yeah, I ran in 2012 because Professor Mills died. He should have run in 2012, and then if I would have run, I would have run in 2016. That's at the end of his term. So I don't think that it's a sense of entitlement. That's that Ghanaians are willing to give a party yeah. a, an opportunity you know, beyond the four years. Mm -hmm. And normally after they have given the opportunity beyond the four years, they begin to believe that, no, we want to change, we want to see something else, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it's been. Yeah. But it can be a sense of entitlement, yeah. Okay, okay. But the discussion of late has been, uh, the, 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 each party is that they are taking turns, NDC, MPP, MPP, NDC, you know. So at the end of the day, what they are saying is that, all, the, all of them are the same. How do you react to the all of them are the same thing, which seems to be creeping into the language these it's, days? It's, it's MPP propaganda. It's a propaganda of the MPP. They are in their mess, and they want to draw everybody else into the same mess. You've messed the country up. Not all politicians are the same, mm. but they are happy to push that mantra and make it look like, oh, whether NDC comes or MPP comes, you're better off staying with us because if NDC comes, it will be the same. <laughs> that is the psychology of the propaganda they are doing. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. Our party has a track record. We have given more Ghanaians electricity than any party in the history of this country. Rawlings started the National Electrification Program and the Rural Electrification Program, which has brought Ghana to above 80% electricity coverage among the top 10 in Africa. We started a digital revolution in this country. Mm. I was Minister of Communications when we divided post and telecommunications and created Ghana Telecom and allowed Space Phone and all the mobile operators to come in. We started laying optic fiber in this country, did the Eastern Corridor optic fiber. And so that whole digital revolution started in our, in our time. We've given more Ghanaians water than any party in the history of this country. When Prof came into office, water coverage was 55%. By the time I left office, water coverage was 72%. Mm -hmm. 72% of Ghanaians had access to good drinking water. We have built all the public universities in this country. MPP hasn't built one public university. They're just good at renaming them with their you know, uh, party uh, figures. And so if somebody builds their university, you come and name it Dumbo University, uh, Tedam University, all your uh, uh, people. You know, if you look at basic education, and secondary education, we built more secondary schools in this country than any other uh, political party. We built more uh, basic education uh, facilities than any other party. 
we give children textbooks for five years, MPP cannot give basic school children textbooks. And so there's a lot that our party has done to improve the prosperity and welfare of Ghanaians. And so don't let them come tell us we and them are the same. We're not the same. You know, they should just wallow in their mess and leave us alone. <laughs> Wallowing in their mess. <laughs> they have created a crisis for Ghanaians. <laughs> just take responsibility for it and uh, just not try to drag us into this whole thing. Mm, I was listening again, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the breaking the eight issue. And um, I think it was uh, the vice president. I said, oh, Mahama, we've beat him before and we'll beat him again. Have you heard him say that? Did you hear the statement? Uh, uh, well, I didn't hear him say it, but I read it. Okay. And uh, this thing, he, does, he says he knows how to beat me. And yeah, that he knows how he's to beaten beat. me before. That's what I saw, that yeah. he's beaten me before. And, he knows, to, yeah. and he knows how to beat. He's beaten me twice, and he knows how to beat me again. But I've never run against him. His face has never been on a presidential ballot paper. So how can you say you've beaten me? I've never run against you as a candidate. It's Donado I ran against in 2012. I beat him. And then in 2016, he won. 2020, he won. So even between Nanado and I, I've won once. He's won twice. Mm. It's just that he's not going to run again. But I'm sure if he was running again, I would have equalized and, you know, taken him out of office. <laughs> <laughs> so just to advise President Bangbia, his face has never, ever been on, the books. on a presidential yeah. ballot paper. And so he should just erase that. Yeah. He knows how to beat me. He's never run against me. Okay. It's the same thing when I was in office. I mean, he just kept waxing about giving lectures about how he was going to handle the economy, how we're incompetent and all that. And I said, look, you've never been in office, you and your presidential candidate. You don't know what it takes to be in office. And they have learned it. Today, look at them taking their, their own, I would say, opponents. Well, uh, one of the presidential flag bearers said, strategies, excuse me, no strategist takes the CD from four CDs to 12 CDs. <laughs> He should be answering those questions. And it's a primary with uh, MPP. So he should concentrate on telling MPP and the country what he can do. I don't know why I'm a boogeyman for him. You know, every, <laughs> he can't get my name out of his lips. Mm -hmm. Folks, we're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, the first thing I want to find out from him is of all the candidates that are contesting in the MPP, which one does he think? can give him the hardest time. But for now, let's take a commercial break. We'll be right back. The KSM Show. Cactus Creek. It is no longer Ghana's best kept secret. It's an open secret. So serene, so heavenly. And the meals? Mm, mm, mm. Just like home cooking, Cactus Creek, your soul will thank you. you are Call our WhatsApp 055 039 5007. Super Essentials has good news for you. If you're in Takradi and its environs, don't worry. You can pick up a Zipa Essentials jacket at Ruler Unisex Boutique in Anaji, Takradi, Queen of Peace in Taco Full Road. Call or WhatsApp 0544-548766. I know there are many of you who are interested in studying in either the USA or Canada. And for most of you, the test is the stumbling book. FX Hub is the only place that can train you to take and pass the test. It's the leading test training center in Africa. Call FX Hub on 0244 829 0244 KSM Show. 
We're back, we're back, we're back. And today, we're coming from the office of the former President John Dramani Mahama. And um, before the commercial break, I promised one question that I want to ask. Um, you've seen the lineup. They, they haven't chosen a flag bearer yet for the MPP. But of the lineup, who do you think can give you the hardest time? Well, um, the first thing to note is that they are all going to run on the legacy of Nana Kofado. They are all inheritors of the mess that they've created for Ghanaians. And so they are not running on any new record. I don't see who is going to be more difficult than the other. We're just waiting for them. Let them choose. It's their prerogative to choose. And when they choose, then we will engage. Hmm. But I don't think any of them would be more difficult than the other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There are few, they themselves are going to cut five out. I hear there's going to be some super delegates, something, something, and they'll cut five out of it. And then after that, there'll be five left. And so we'll see who those five are. And eventually we'll see who emerges and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll engage. But I'm certain that whichever of them they uh, bring before us will we'll win the election. Mm -hmm. Does it sometimes go to that? Somewhere along the line, some independent, as we've been saying in Ghana these days, uh, third force. Somebody can emerge from somewhere. Kofi Kranting, have you, have you listened to Kofi Kranting? I've listened to him. Yeah, yeah. I've heard him. Yes. Yeah. Or him, somebody just emerges. They don't win, but they win enough votes to prevent anybody from getting 50, from getting 51 point, 50 point one, I'm sorry. Yeah, but that, it? but that has happened before. It won't be the first time that... Mm. Um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be going into a second round. If you remember in 2000, um, no party got a first round victory. And so Kofor only got elected on a second round. And then again, if you remember in um, 2008, no party got 50% plus and President Mills got elected on a second round. So it mm -hmm. won't be the first time. They've always been smaller mm -hmm. parties that takes some one point something percentage points. And so the lead runner gets like 48 point something. And so that one point something percentage points that the little parties took, if you added it to the lead runner, they probably would have caused, caused the 50%. So we've always had that, that, that possibility, yeah. yeah. But I think what people are looking at are looking at um, the Nigerian example um, when Peter Obi moved to National Labour Party. Now let me explain what happened in Nigeria. Peter Obi was um, Atiku's running mate mm -hmm. in 2019, in the 2019 election. In 2023, I don't know the dynamics, but one would have thought that they would pair together again, you know, to uh, run, because Buhari was leaving, and, and um, APC was having to bring a new person who turned out to be Tinubu. Now, instead of pairing together, they decided to go their separate ways. So Peter Obi joined the National Labour Party and he took a lot of constituencies that belonged to the PDP before. Mm -hmm. So he had left the PDP, it was a break away from the PDP, and the PDP used to win the South East. National Labour Party, because of Peter Obi, won the South East. He won the urban areas like Lagos and other places, and then a lot of states that PDP used to win, he took votes away from them. Nigeria is different because Nigeria does not have 50% plus. Mm. You must get a certain percentage of a certain number of states. And so what happened was National Labour Party and PDP, if you add their votes together, it comes to almost 13 million votes. And Tinubu won with 8 point something million votes or 9 point something million votes. And so they have a completely different system. Mm. Yeah, but mm. um, in Ghana, Sometimes elections go into second rounds, mm -hmm. and um, it's a bit difficult to run as an independent, as an individual, because you need to mop up constituencies. And the thing with the political parties is they have the structures on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so maybe a third force could come, which would be a party that would so energize mm -hmm. a certain segment of the society that they can threaten to win or throw it into a second round and become the kingmakers 
mm. you know, if it does go into a second round. Mm. Mm. It's all, there's always a possibility of mm. anything, yeah. Mm. Okay. I want to move into a different, not totally different, but focus on you as JM. Oh, his excellence. What else is there to know about me? I've been, <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the public eye for, for a long time. God no, knows but, yeah, yes. questions that people ask sometimes. <laughs> and, and, and listen to this, you know. You assemblyman, assemblyman to deputy minister, to minister, to vice president, to president. I think you have done it all. Mm? Yeah. And especially in Ghana where you were vilified like there was no tomorrow. Yeah. And every person would have said, I've done my bit. Like you said, prosperity will judge my time. You know, what is it in there that make you decide that, no, I want to be in the race? So I say, no, I Mahama wa ebi. Don't call me a cry. From assembly Mahama to president, they didn't view. What else is he going to do? You know, I want you well, to answer that question. Yeah, uh, first, is it, do I, infringe the constitution if I run no, for don't. a second term. I'm entitled to a second term. Does it infringe the constitution? It doesn't. So I, I don't see where there's a problem there. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing is, yeah, I could, the easiest thing for me to do would be to take a rest mm -hmm. and just walk away and do other things. I have, I'm passionate about a lot of things. I like agriculture, I like to farm. And so it would be nice if you came and visited me on my farm in Yape or Bunsunu. We sit under a tree, they roast some guinea fowls for us. And, some pito. And we, if you want pito, I could order it. <laughs> 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 so that would have been the easiest thing for me yeah. to do. But when you are a person that God has blessed and your country has given you so much, then you don't want to withhold whatever you can you have from your country. I am a person who went to school in Ghana. I went to the University of Ghana at a time when they actually paid us for going to university. Mm. We received the, we used to call it payee, and it was a weekly payment that we used to mm. receive, you mm. know. And so my country educated me, and I got the opportunity to serve as a member of parliament for 12 years. And so I understand the legislature, I understand the standing orders of parliament and everything. I got the opportunity to serve in ministerial positions in the telecom space. I got the opportunity to be an opposition MP when Kufo was president. And so I know how it is to advocate on the opposition side. And I became vice president and became president for one term. Yeah. My party needs my services. I didn't say endorse me. I said, if it's your wish that I run, elect me. And uh, the, the experience that I've garnered, I'll put at the service of my party and my country. And my party elected me. And so the next thing is for Ghanaians to, to make a decision. I'm not imposing myself. I'm offering myself for elections. And if Ghanaians think that the experience and expertise I have in this time of crisis can turn things around, yes, I'm available to do it. And there are times when generals have been called from retirement to come back yeah. because their nations are in battle. We're in battle this time. The mess into which this administration has plunged this country, it needs all qualified people in Ghana to be able to do it. And I keep telling them, you can't do it alone because you don't have all the intelligence and experience in your heads. You need every Ghanaian to be able to succeed. And that's why in my time, I didn't behave like I knew it all. When we were facing economic crisis, I called the Senchi uh, Forum. Mm -hmm. And we called mm -hmm. people of all walks of life. Everybody came and talked. PV of being of blessed memory, Kwesi Boitri of blessed memory. You know, all of them s helped to synthesize that report into eventually what we took as the homegrown fiscal consolidation to the IMF and got a program which helped to stabilize the economy. And we handed over to this new administration. And so, yes. We have offered ourselves for service, and when I come into office, we're going to go by consensus. The first thing we'll do is a stakeholder uh, will show Ghanaians the books and show them what the actual economic figures are and show them the challenges that we face as a nation. And we'll get everybody involved and help 
for us to lift it out. We'll look at this free SHS again mm -hmm. and then see what they... I was going to that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so ask it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you must said it. No, but I was going to ask you, you know, among the things that you have said you're going to do is to yes. review. Yes, review. What, what, what goes into that review? What that, that, exactly are you going to do when you review it? Are you going to review it and keep it, change it, dismantle it? I'll tell you, KSM, that is part of the propaganda they used in 2020. They told Ghanaians that if I come, I'll cancel free SHS. Mm -hmm. That was their main campaign message. If he comes, he's going to cancel free SHS. He's going to cancel free SHS. And so, of course, for those who wanted to hedge and say, look, we will even give you the opportunity to come so that you cancel it. But I said, review. Good policy, poor implementation. And if you ask all the headmasters mm -hmm. and all the stakeholders in the education space, they'll tell you that the implementation has been very poor. And so all I told the president was that, call all the stakeholders together. Bring the academics, bring the teachers, bring the educationists, bring the students, bring their parents and everybody together and say, what are the challenges that we face with this free SHS? They'll mm -hmm. tell you in terms of facilities, in terms of uh, feeding, access to uh, good uh, nutrition, in terms of uh, uh, classroom blocks, accommodation. Um, they'll tell you about um, lack of access to books and other things. Poor teacher motivation. I mean, there's so many things that will come up. And apart from that, even in their agreement with the World Bank, they agree in the World Bank uh, that they're going to implement that the SHS, free SHS was poorly targeted, hmm. you know, because you want to make sure that the best of benefits go to the poorest. And so if people like me were taking out, people like you were taking out, because you can afford to pay your child's school fees, in school, people like us were taking out, it will leave more money to benefit the rural poor and the others who really need it. Mm. But right now, if you want to pay your child's school fees, there's no mechanism for paying your child's school fees. And so it says retarget it and make sure that you're covering the poorest secondary schools, the poorest families, and then take people like KSM and John Mahama out, you know, and tell us we can pay our full fees. That would even help the schools in a way. When your grant doesn't come, mm. at least our monies would have come. You, tell us to pay before our children go. And so you use it for the rest of the children while you wait for government to bring its, its money. So when I say review, which, you know, Pre President uh, Akufuado said means abolished. In his lexicon, mm. review means <laughs> abolished. You know, then they use that as propaganda. But right now they've agreed as part of the IMF, IMF terms yeah. that they're going to look at free SHS again, exactly what I was telling them. So it's taking them almost four years to come to that conclusion. Mm. Mm -hmm. Another thing too that I've heard you talk about is the S gratia. And when it comes to S gratia, I always tease that that's the only time you can get bipartisan agreement. You know, if there's S gratia, whether NDC, MPP, CVP, we all agree on S gratia. And you have sort of hinted or said that it's something that you would do away with. Yeah. You know, we, we cancelled S gratia for all workers in the PNDC time. Mm. Workers used to get ex gratia okay. anytime they were leaving, and mm. we canceled it for all of them. But when the 1992 constitution came, it said that the president shall set up a commission which would determine the emoluments and privileges or whatever of a certain category of staff. And that category includes all members of the executive, all members of the legislature, mm -hmm. all members of the judiciary, uh, work, uh, uh, workers of uh, uh, workers of NCC, National Media Commission, I mean all those uh, uh, constitutional bodies. And so their emoluments were not to be determined by the Fair Wages uh, uh, Committee, which is the body for dealing with wages, wage negotiations and all that. So they are handled in a different manner. Now what happens is, and we will stop that practice when I come. Within the first 100 days when I become president, I'll set up the committee to determine the emoluments. What happens is, normally the committee is set up when the president is getting ready to leave office. Mm. So by the time they determine the emoluments, 
at the end of the term, government has to pay arrears of four years. And that is what um, is seen as a lump sum that goes to um, uh, ministers and other people like that. But aside from that, there's an ex gratia payment. It's like, uh, thank you for your services, and mm. that is paid. Some people call it gratuity. Others call it ex gratia, but whatever it is, mm. it's a lump sum payment that is given, given to you. When I left office in uh, 2016, in 2016, I think the lump, the total, my arrears came to 200 and something thousand CDs. And then my gratuity came to 200 and something thousand CDs. So in all, I received about 500 and something thousand. As president of the republic, 500 and something thousand. So what we're saying is that we want everybody to be treated fairly. And so in our manifesto, we said that instead of a presidential emoluments committee for this category of people and fair wages for this other category, we'll have an independent emoluments committee that will handle emoluments for all public sector workers. So that is our suggestion. And that's what I'm saying. But we need a constitutional amendment to be able to do that. And so we must amend the constitution to set up an independent emoluments committee and take away the, uh, we call them Article 74 office holders. But in the meantime, I can determine that if you want to serve in, in my government, voluntarily we'll say we're not taking ex gratia. Mm. So if you serve in my government, you must give up ex gratia. I have the right to do that. And so we've said that for our government that is coming, we're not going to pay ex gratia. And I cannot, I cannot order that it be not paid to the judiciary and the legislature. Mm. But I said I will encourage the other arms of government to do the same, mm. you know. Mm. Mm. He'll encourage the other arms of government to do the same. We'll take a commercial break right here. When we come back, more of John Dramani Mahama. We'll be right back. <laughs> KSM Show. Cactus Creek. It is no longer Ghana's best kept secret. It's an open secret. So serene, so heavenly. And the meals? Mm -mm -mm. Just like home cooking. Cactus Creek. Your soul will thank you. You are always welcome. Call our WhatsApp 055 039 5007. Super Essentials has good news for you. If you're in Takradi and its environs, don't worry. You can pick up a Zipa Essentials jacket at Ruler Unisex Boutique in Anaji, Takradi, Queen of Peace in Taco Full Road. Call or WhatsApp 0544-548766. Alls Fitness Center, the premier destination for fitness in Ghana. Meet the indefatigable captain. There are three things that I love doing. Number one, workout. Number two, workout. Number three, workout. Workout put mind, soul, and body together. The captain has spoken. Bright lights, yeah, they make me dizzy, logo liggy. I just want the lizzy. Logo Liggy, uptown chasing for the Lizzie. Downtown, everybody busy. Logo Liggy, like the Logo Liggy. I just want the Paul's Fitness Center, yeah. East Ligon Branch, Lizzie Sports Complex, I Cotton really Street, East Ligon, Accra, Ghana, 0302 519 675. Kumasi Branches, 
Officers uh, Mess Branch, Denyame, Major Covenant Drive, Kumasi, 0541 871 602. Golden Tulip, Kumasi City Branch, Rain Tree Street, 0322 492 647. Pulse, the premier destination for fitness in Ghana. Say what lie we for around town. I know there are many of you who are interested in studying in either the USA or Canada. And for most of you, the test is the stumbling book. FX Hub is the only place that can train you to take and pass the test. It's the leading test training center in Africa. Call FX Hub on 0244-829-9555. The KSM Show. We're back, we're back, we're back, and uh, we're hanging out in the office of the former president, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. And uh, I have to call him this because I'm in his office, you know. <laughs> when I'm with friends, they will jam, jam. <laughs> I will say jam, jam. <laughs> I noticed that when you're speaking, you keep saying, when I come into office, when I come into office. Is that the... Uh, 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 what do you call it? A signal of your confidence? <laughs> you don't say if you. You're saying when. when? You're, you're that sure? <laughs> well, on the NDC that side, we're very sure that <laughs> we're winning the election. Yeah, uh, we're winning the election. We're taking all the right steps, mm. you know, and I, I, I get a feeling that was missing before, that our people have the edge to win. Mm. And so you can tell that they are... You didn't feel that before? No, you could see that, I mean, they were going through the motions and they'll do what they have to do. But this time you can see they have a hunger to win. Mm. And that was accentuated by Asin North. The mm. victory in mm. Asin North has done mm -hmm. everything to mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. embolden our people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with the strategy we use in Asin North, well, I'll not say it here so that <laughs> they don't. <laughs> but it was a formula that worked. Mm. And we want to replicate that nationwide. Mm. Yeah, mm. one of the things to do is to prevent MPP from doing what they do best, rigging elections. And so we will stop them from doing it. Are and you suggesting that if you hadn't done whatever it is you did in uh, St. North, it would have been rigged? Well, let me say, they, if you give them the opportunity, don't manipulate the elections. If you give them the opportunity, don't manipulate the elections. And we made sure they didn't have that opportunity. In Kumawu, we did it to the best of our ability. But of course, Kumau is one of their strongholds. We've never won Kumau. And so, I mean, vote buying took place, but at least we manned the polling stations much better. And so, what the results that came from the polling stations are actually the votes that were cast in the ballot boxes. Mm -hmm. And so, we appreciated by 54% in terms of votes. They actually reduced yes. in terms of votes. And so we implemented it again in Asin North. We manned the polling stations properly to make sure that every ballot that goes into the box is well accounted for. Mm -hmm. And it was well accounted for. Mm -hmm. And we appreciated the percentage of victory from 55% to above 57%. Mm -hmm. So we know what formula to adopt. And that's why I say when we come into office. <laughs> <laughs> If I can get a little personal in, the, in, the, in this segment, um, being in, in the hot seat, you know, considering what you've been through, as for vilification, you probably get the, what was it, the Guinness Award, <laughs> Guinness Book of Records for vilification. You, you, you took your, your, yeah. your fair share yeah. or unfair share, whichever way. Yeah. How does your wife feel about her darling husband throwing himself again into this? Well, you know, it's been biologically proven, generally, that women are more emotional than men. It's, it's biological. It's their makeup. Mm. And so they get more affected by negative situations than men. Now, let me show you why. If you take even our current politics, a lot of women won't go into politics mm. because 
emotionally they can't take the kinds of insults that come in yeah. our politics. You know, so women take it harder than men. I have been in it for how many years? Almost 30 years now. <laughs> and so you say that you develop a thick skin. And so you're able to take as well as you also give. And so you throw the punches, they throw the punches at you. Mm -hmm. But women take it quite, you know, hard when things like that happen. So when we left office, Lodna was happy that at last she had her husband back. And um, she was against my running again. Mm. Indeed, I'll tell you something. I was go it's going to come in my book when I write it eventually. Um, and it was an occasion where Lodina went to Professor Mills and complained about the bashing that I was, <laughs> I was taking, mm. you know, as his vice Even president. Even as vice, yeah. When I was Professor Mills' vice president. I was complaining about the bashing her husband was receiving and that she's having sleepless nights. And Professor Mills asked her, he said, ah, but where do you hear all this? He said, but you, don't you listen to the radio stations? <laughs> Every morning when you open the radio station, you're insulting my husband. Then Professor Mills said, so why listen to the radio station? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Prof, Prof was just such a fantastic man. <laughs> and you know in tree how you say it. Uh, ah, I say, I radio stations, sir. I mean, I radio stations, sir. And what do you you of Then Lodina said, yes. I say, I say, Africa magic. Well, <laughs> Let me translate that in English. Yeah. He said, but why listen to the radio stations? He says, don't listen to the radio stations. I, prof, I don't listen because I don't want to get high blood pressure, yeah. so I don't listen to the yeah. radio station. And then he asked Lodina, do you have DSTV at home? Yeah, Lodina said, yes, we have. He said, you go and tune it. There's a station, Africa Magic. <laughs> <laughs> he says, they show a lot of interesting films. When you go home, just tune Africa Magic. <laughs> you know, so... She's always, you know, uh, quite affected when uh, those kinds of things mm. happen. And so in 2020, she didn't want me to run. But um, once I took the decision, she supported, supported. me. Yeah. And um, in 2024, again, she didn't want me to run. <laughs> she says, look, so you when they insult you, you don't get don't tired. <laughs> <laughs> Not only hell, most <laughs> guys <laughs> You know, but once I take the decision, she stands behind me. Okay. Yeah, so okay. she's accepted it. And, uh, Show us some love, man. <laughs> <laughs> what about children? I'm asking about the wife. What about, how do they feel? They, they, that's their daddy that's being bashed. Yeah. Um, the kids will always support me. And um, now they've come of age. And mm. so they understand mm. it better. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Shafiq is in, uh, he's just, he's finished his master's and uh, his wife has gotten us a beautiful oh. uh, granddaughter. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> so, he is on social media and so he goes on social media and then he supports, he supports us uh, on social media. Uh, Shafiq does the same. Uh, Jesse is in university in Canada studying and then Sharaf is the one who loves football and was playing in Germany but he's back here working with young people he set up a foundation to mm. promote mm. football mm. amongst young people so he gives them balls and jerseys and things like that but they've taken it quite well and um, they are supporting once I take the decision they all support, they will support me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let's fast forward 2024. Mm -hmm. I don't know how difficult it is, what it was for you in 16, 1916, when you had to write a concession speech yeah. after the whole world had been told that yeah. you're in a comfortable lead, and then you have to actually write a concession speech. How, 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 I just want to go back to that moment and find out what was going through your head writing that speech. As a candidate, you must anticipate that anything can happen. Even when you're confident, you anticipate that a situation could arise where you might have to concede. And so as president, I had two speeches drafted. 
Oh, you had two speeches. I had two speeches. I had a victory speech and a concession speech. Oh, oh if you, sorry. Uh, if really? you're president, you should always have two speeches. <laughs> because wow. you, you don't know which one you have to read. <laughs> <laughs> but they're in draft form. Okay. And so you finalize it after. When, after the results So that, come. that speech that I read, I finalized it just hours before I delivered it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And so I finalized it and, uh, yeah, I read it. And you're looking forward to writing a victory No, but speech. when you're a, when no. you're a candidate, mm. uh, you opposition... You both, yeah. No, you don't. I mean, you don't need... You don't need... You need a victory speech in the event you win. You can do a concession speech later. When, later. You can, and yeah. even then, you don't need a speech. You just call and congratulate your whoever it is. So you don't really need a speech. But you need a victory speech. After you've been declared, mm. you have to mm. speak mm. to the nation, mm. yeah. People, people have said you are too much of a gentleman and they wonder if you have the, the metal that it takes to really discipline people, you have to discipline, things like that. You know? And I remember there was a lot of flack when um, Gabi Ochidakon came to your house. You know? so what was he going to do there? Why did he allow him to go there? Da, 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 da. Stuff like that. You know, Ghanaians, we get hard on people for whatever reason. What was what was your reaction? And are you are you soft in inner soft or you are? Professor Mills was a gentleman, wasn't he? Very much so. Yeah, <laughs> but he was one of our successful presidents, one of our most successful presidents. Are you saying Akufado is not a gentleman? Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> what's wrong? <laughs> gentleman can be president. <laughs> <laughs> I trumped you there. <laughs> 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 you did. You did trump me. <laughs> well, I do think that uh, people have different character traits and uh, people will do things differently. Um, I do think we need presidents who are compassionate but firm. Mm. And so you make sure the right thing is done, but you must be able to be compassionate when you need to be, you know. So I would do things different from President Akufado does. For instance, if the national anthem is being played clear and the chief doesn't get time, I'm not going to shout and ask them to go and, you know, because that's not my disposition. You don't know what is wrong with the chief. And it turned out that the man said he was not feeling too well. And so I've been at national events. There are some people seated. You don't know yeah. why they are seated. And so, I mean, out of respect for the anthem, we all stand up. And when we finish, we sit down. There might be something wrong that makes them sit, sit. So we do things differently. But the important thing is to be firm when it comes to the principles of uh, governing. That is firm in the fight against corruption. You must be prepared to prosecute your opponents after they have left office, just as much as you prosecute your own people mm. when they do the same things. Mm. And that's what Nana Kufado has not been able to do. His justice is selective. It's all about the previous government. And his people have done more grievous things for which he just uh, uh, turns a blind eye. And so what Ghanaians need is justice and prosperity. Uh, adherence to the principles of the Constitution. And for us, for me, I think our work is cut out for us. One, um, the economy, to stabilize the economy and put it on track to start creating more jobs, especially in the private sector. And then two, to do the reviews in governance that make sure that we reform the state institutions and let them work the way they should. Mm -hmm. Because People should go to the courts and feel confidence that they will get confident that they'll get justice from the courts. People should have a police service that is efficient and professional. We should have uh, uh, security services that are efficient and professional. Mm. You know, we should have public services that are delivering proper service to the people. Mm. But your sense, what should be put in place to make sure that these things do happen? Because everybody says that you know we need to have a good, efficient that, that, that. We need to be strict in this and that, you know. But we, we say it, we seem to know all the right things to say, but what are the structures that we need to actually put down that will ensure some of these things that yes, you're talking yes, about? Yes, I mean, it won't happen overnight. And that's why government is like a baton race. 
And so in 92, we adopted a constitution. We set up the institutions. And we, the constitution uh, serves as a guide how the, uh, the institutions should operate. And it meant that we needed to continue to strengthen those institutions. Mm. President Rawlings did it to a point. President Kufo took over and continued with strengthening the institutions. President Mills continued, I continued. What problem we have today is that those, the progress we made has been reversed because we have a president who believes in packing the institutions with clearly partisan people. He's done it to the Electoral Commission. He sacked the commissioners and brought new commissioners. Recently, he's appointed additional commissioners who are known to have a background as MPP Aparachiki. He doesn't care, you understand? If you go and ask people in the security services, promotions are no longer based on merit. They are based on your political inclination. These are things that weaken those services. There's a state enterprise where the CEO is ill, and yet you won't let him go home on health grounds. You create an IMC to manage the uh, corporation while he's sitting at home uh, uh, on health grounds. You know, things like that. And then you, put, you pack the institutions with your chairman's children, recruitment, they do secret recruitment into the security services now. They don't advertise. You just hear that people are there training. And when you go, it's their chairman's children and other people. And so you politicize those institutions. And when you politicize them, you weaken them. Everybody must have a fair chance to be recruited into state institutions. And so when we're there, we even at a point we're doing regional recruitments. We used to send to so that we make sure that every region, you know, is fairly captured in the recruitments that we do. Right now, it's done secretly. You see people are training. Right now, if you go to the depot, there are people training there. And there was no advertis advertisement, nothing. Mm. So what's wrong with us as a nation then? If these things they can be written off as this is these are claims from uh, John Mahama, he, he's in a position, he wants power, so he's saying everything. If these things, like you're saying, are all truth and they can be backed with documents, who is supposed to be talking about them and showcasing to Ghana that these things are happening? Is it the opposition parties? Is it the uh, media? Who, who, who's, who's quiet that these things are happening? It's actually all of us. The opposition, the point is, the onus has been left on only the opposition. The opposition alone cannot speak for all the people. It takes the opposition, it takes the media, it takes moral authority. Moral authority includes traditional rulers, it includes uh, clergymen, it includes imams and all of them. It, it takes CSOs, civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, all to make sure that we raise our voices when something is going wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but unfortunately, um, some segments of these um, uh, 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 groups have been cowed by this government. I mean, there are media people who have been threatened. There are some who have been killed, and nobody has been punished for it. You know, and there are people who say, when you do a, present, a, a, a show and you are the presenter and you go hard on government, um, by the time you leave the, the show, your producer receives a call and asks why you were going hard on government. There are people who complain that they even get threats, you know, against their person. So it's made people cowed and it makes them reluctant to speak up when they see injustice done. But the point is, if injustice continues and you don't speak up, one day you yourself will be affected mm -hmm. by it, and there'll be nobody to speak for you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, we're hanging out with uh, His Excellency, the former President, John Dramani Mahama. And uh, in our dying minutes, because thank you so much for, for, for hosting us for this long, because I've gone longer than my usual time. This is special, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in, 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 in the final dying minutes, and this is your camera, huh? Uh, yeah. Just let's say you, you keep saying when I'm elected. So I won't say if I'm saying when you're elected. Let's say you are the president and you're talking to the nation for the first time. 
being re-elected again. What will be your first few words to Ghana? I want you to look in that camera and let's hear. Well, uh, I'll tell Ghanaians to keep hope alive. Um, I know that we have come through a crisis and um, we're going to work to make sure that things get better and that we expect that everybody will bring hands on board. We want to make sure that all Ghanaians enjoy the opportunities Ghana has to offer. It shouldn't matter what your religious affiliation is. It shouldn't matter what your political orientation is or even your ethnic uh, orientation. All Ghanaians own this country and all of us must come together to make this country better. I'm going to give the leadership, but I can't do it alone. We need everybody to come on board in order that we can create a land of dignity and prosperity for our people. And that was J.M. <laughs> well, first of all, let me, let me thank you. It's been a long chase <laughs> from 2016 till today. <laughs> so for those of you who think, hey, guess I'm not so afraid from people, but uh, 2016, I feel no more. And look, I don't know there are, there are times I get your text Pardon? and I just keep quiet. Keep quiet. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> but thank you. So, folks, thank you very much for joining us. This has been a special KSM show. And if it's gone longer than the usual time, because it's, it's a special. And um, thank you all for listening. And uh, trust me, we'll be back with some more specials as the time goes on. So, in the meantime, your Excellency, thank you very much. Yeah. And if you can help me to sign off, KSM saying we are uh, out, out of. Let the whole world say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>